Hey, hey, my wonderful period party community. It is so great to be back with you all for a brand new episode after our winter break. There's been some crazy amazing stuff brewing at Fix Your Period headquarters, and that is my brand new membership called the Fix Your Period Collective. It is a first of its kind membership that is going to change the face of women's health. I kid you not. You can get on the waiting list and get more of the juicy details at bit.ly slash FYP collective. Okay, let's get to today's episode. My guest is Katie Edmonds, a nutritional therapist, paleo autoimmune certified coach, creator of the popular blog Heal Endo, and author of the four-week endometriosis diet plan and Heal Endo, an anti-inflammatory approach to healing from endometriosis. After putting her own endometriosis into remission, something she never knew was possible, Katie has developed education and offerings around a research-backed diet and lifestyle shown to help heal the chronic inflammation and immune dysfunction with that those with endometriosis experience. In this episode, we talk in depth about why surgery is not a viable option for the majority of people with endo and why we have to start viewing endo as a chronic inflammatory condition that acts more like an autoimmune disease so we can begin to adequately help the growing number of people with this condition. I know this is a contentious subject, so please give it a listen and share your thoughts with me over on Instagram. You can find me at Nicole M. like Madeline Jardim, and I would be happy to have a conversation with you about this topic. Enjoy the episode. Hi, Katie. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. This is going to be a nice, juicy conversation about endometriosis. So everyone buckle up (laughs) because I love Katie's perspective on it. So again, thank you so much. And I feel like I would love for us to begin with your experience of endometriosis and how you were able to put your endo into remission. Yeah. So I was diagnosed with endometriosis about 15 years ago, and I was very lucky to be diagnosed with suspected endo really early. So a lot of people wait a decade or more for a diagnosis. So I was extremely lucky, but, um, you know, I had this unraveling by endo, I call it. And the decade after is like, I did everything the doctor said I did birth control. I did two poorly done surgeries. So, um, the ones that are just generic by your local ob guy who delivers babies and then also does surgery on the side. Um, and then I tried all these holistic healing things too, that you see. And it was like, do everything to lower your estrogen, um, cut out a hundred different food groups. Um, and you know, over the course of the next decade, I found myself getting a little bit better. Um, and that kind of makes you addicted to finding new treatments, right? It's like throw mud at the wall to see what will stick. Um, but I, at the same time was getting way worse. And by the end of the decade, I had all these, these symptoms that are associated with endo. It's like chronic fatigue, huge endo belly. Um, I was getting headaches. I had joint pain, you know, I call it body falling apart syndrome or oh, I just I've felt never like... heard that. Wow. Yeah. That okay. So well, I, made yes. it, I made up body falling apart syndrome. <laughs> That's just something I, used to well, describe it. I just assume someone was, was referring to it as that because that sounds you know, like very relatable for a lot of us. <laughs> it's like, Oh, my back hurts and my knees hurt and my ankle hurts. And I went for a half mile run. And now I feel like I can only lay on the couch for a week because I had that much inflammation coursing through my body. And every time I would Google, like why chronic fatigue and endometriosis would be like, oh, cause the pain is so bad. You can't handle it. And, um, that wasn't my story at all. You know, nothing was really making sense. I'd Google why infertile, like why dealing with infertility? If I know my fallopian tubes are open, like the doctors checked, I passed the test. Like there's no reason technically that I wouldn't be getting pregnant. So it was kind of the anger at the unfairness of the situation that fueled me to seek new truths. And I say, as my silver lining was getting really, really effing angry about it. So what I did is I started scouring PubMed. And the first thing I discovered is that endometriosis is not caused by, um, by estrogen. Um, it's affected by estrogen, but it is not caused by estrogen. And my brain basically exploded because I had spent the previous 10 years trying everything to ax estrogen. You know, everything was hormonal based. Like I just thought having endometriosis meant I had so much estrogen coursing through my body causing endometriosis. I had to get rid of the estrogen. Well, that's not the case. You can have too much estrogen if you have endo, but you can also have normal levels or you can have very low levels and following my symptoms. It looked like I had low levels of estrogen and extremely low levels of progesterone that was contributing to my personal uh, story. And we're all different and unique with endo and something to internalize. Um, the second thing I discovered is that endo was an inflammatory disease. So it's very complex. It's not like just having inflammation 
makes endo and or just having endo makes you inflamed. There's so many different factors going on here. But when you start to look at the whole disease, the complexity of it, inflammation is driving everything from part of the creation of an endo-like cell to begin with, to the establishment of endo lesions, to progression into worse forms of disease, to scar tissue and adhesions. It always goes back to inflammation. Inflammation gone rogue, not behaving as it should. So that's the immune dysfunction part. And then inflammation that's not ending because it has to end. Inflammation is gnarly, you know, like if you ever had a swollen finger after bee sting, that's inflammation doing that. So if you have that inflammation that never ends going on inside of you, um, obviously that's going to cause problems. So at the time I kind of thought, okay, it kind of seems like an autoimmune disorder. Um, I'm going to treat it like that. Now I'm going to stop focusing on this hormonal thing. My cleanses, my juice cleanses and my liver cleanses. I don't know why I was just cleansing. I had to cleanse the endo out of my body. I think many people can relate to that. So I started to do this whole new approach. I was, um, I started slowing down completely, you know, um, focusing on replenishing my body with nutrients. I had totally lost. I was basically not eating any nutrients on my, um, my silly endo diet I had created. Um, doing, uh, movement, uh, like physical therapy, realignment type work, natural movement stuff. That's so different than that, you know, intense exercise I was doing before, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is what my whole book is about actually, but it was, it was putting all these things together that my goal was to get pregnant, um, because I had never heard, you know, anything else could really happen with endo. There was no me searching for snake oil here. Um, but what happened in the process is I put my endo into complete clinical remission, which I had no idea was possible. Like no one ever says that, you know, our tagline is there's no cure, which equals there is no hope. You know, there's also no cure for cancer. There's also no cure for autoimmune diseases, but people put those in remission all the time through many different factors, right? Like there's no one size fits all approach to those diseases or to endo. For me, I was incredibly lucky to not need an excision surgery. Um, And I want to say that's not because surgery is bad. I'm not lucky that I got to avoid this horrendous surgery. Surgery is great for people with endo who need it and can afford it. I live in Hawaii and I called around for surgery and it was $65,000 out of pocket. You know, I'm in my early twenties. Like, are you kidding me? Like that's a down payment on a house and I can't even afford that. So for me, it was like the doors were shut on what I thought were the traditional treatment options. So, um, so anyways, this was a miracle to me. It's one of those things where you want to shout it from the rooftops. Like, Yes, people can need surgery. Obviously, many people absolutely need surgery, but for me, I didn't. And what if you have surgery and you're still feeling awful, right? Like that happens all the time too. And that's less talked about. So this is the holistic side of things. Um, Let's lower the inflammation and see where your endo goes and where your health goes. And this started my website, um, my two books that I have published, uh, my Instagram and working with women as a nutritional therapist. This is a fantastic story. And I really loved what you said about there's no cure. So technically that means there's no hope. And Mm -hmm. I can imagine that that rings true for so many people who are in the throes of endometriosis right now. And so I'm curious from your perspective, why do you think endo is so misunderstood? Why is it such a misunderstood disease by the medical community and society as a whole? Yeah. Um, It's a great question. I I talk about this in a chapter in my book specifically because I think it's really important to understand why it's misunderstood rather than saying we have this continued phrase, we just don't know much about endo or we need more research. We absolutely need more research, yes, but we do know a lot. So first of all, there's a 17 year lag between what research has uncovered and what doctors know. So a lot of us are being treated by our OB-GYNs, what they learned in medical school, which if they're older, it was like a long time ago, you know, they're not having a lot of updates on endo. Um, The current gynecological recommendations are very, very ancient. And this is why you've heard that they actually recommended to do start with birth control and then move on to surgery if that doesn't fix symptoms, because there's just not much you know about endo. So they did a a questionnaire. And it's something like two thirds of ob said they were unfamiliar with endo's biggest symptoms and they were uncomfortable diagnosing it and treating it. Wow. So this is a huge problem because these are the doctors you're referred to, to deal with your endo, right? So if you're, um, your doctors are your first line of defense. So they're saying, we don't really know how to treat it. And they're saying this on a questionnaire. What they're telling you is um, probably, they're not probably saying they're uncomfortable. They're just saying, whatever, it's fine. You know, I know what I'm doing. Here's your, here's your birth control. And what happens is when the doctors say they don't know much about endo, or maybe you're a failure of a patient for not responding, or this can't be endo because you don't have these symptoms because they're unfamiliar, is it starts to make us feel crazy and society, you know, it can be the society pointing the fingers like, 
well, you can't be sick. The doctor's saying you're fine, you know, and you're, well, the doctors know what endo is. Like it's this incredibly enormous, complex inflammatory disease. Um, we then are, that's is where all the gaslighting can stem from. You know, I talk in my book that you have the holistic healers saying stuff like do this maple syrup cleanse for 14 days and it will clear your endo out of you. You know, I had a, a client say their chiropractor told them that I'm like, why is a chiropractor telling you how to treat endo? And why would they recommend that of all things? You know, you have the liver cleanses, the vegan diet, now like the carnivore diet, all these things is like a one, a one-stop shop to fix endo. And that's just not it. You know, it's, I, I feel like the people who have the one-stop um, fix it strategy are so lucky. And I applaud you for being so lucky. Like literally the woman who cut out dairy and felt her symptoms go into remission. And like, if you believe that's just symptoms, um, but she reclaimed her life, you know, that's something to be spoken for. And then someone who literally just had a, a properly done exigent surgery, they didn't do any diet and lifestyle, but they've, you know, been quote unquote cured, you know, they're in complete remission as well. Um, then there's just people like me that had to do so many different things, really integrate all sorts of healing modalities to get to the place of, of health. So it just takes a lot of, um, a lot of care and patience. And that's not how our medical system works, you know, the care, care and patience, right? No girl, that is not how it works. That's, <laughs> that is the truth, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't really help that as you describe, right. Endometriosis develops more like a story rather than just like this one thing, this one event that, you know, like we were born with it or, you know, it happened because we, we had a certain diet or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so, because again, right. Treating a multifaceted condition is very difficult and certainly yeah. not the way mainstream medicine is set up, unfortunately. So I would love for you to talk about that. I love that how you describe this, right? It develops like a story. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Yes. Yes. And I want to say um, some, this is a little unfamiliar to a lot of people, um, how, how to describe it. So I like to sometimes compare it to cancer, not to scare people because there is a bit of a fear in the endo community of um, endo mutating into cancer. Mm. That's not what I'm talking about here. Just think of them as two separate diseases, but you know, it starts with getting an endo like cell. And this is what you might've read a lot on social media or something. And it's like an endometrial cell, but totally different. And, um, research shows it probably was an endometrial cell to begin with. And it's completely genetically altered. This is why it runs in families, you know, like it, and research shows maybe 50% of endometriosis is genetic part of handed down in lines. I think it might be a lot more than that. I don't know anyone with endo who doesn't have endo in their family as well. Right. Um, but that's just what the research shows. And then the other part is all these epigenetic alterations. So there's so many things that go into creating this mutant monster cell. It's really aggressive. It can be insanely sensitive to estrogen. It can have zero progesterone receptors, right? So that's not just progesterone resistant. That's like, it doesn't respond to progesterone, which is the only antagonist to estrogen. So that can be a bigger part of the problem than estrogen for a lot of us. It's aggressive. It can infiltrate into nooks and crannies and it's made out of stem cells, right? That's what endometrial lining is. It re it rebuilds itself every month after it disappears during your period. So that's a magic power. That's incredible for building babies, but that you don't want moving around your body. So there's all these different steps just to make an endo like cell and why it can behave so different in different people, depending on what that cell is exposed to. Um, like BPA, phthalates, um, dioxins, glyphosate, they're all associated with different, different ways these endo-like cells can behave, as well as just being exposed to chronic inflammation. So if you have chronic inflammation in your pelvis peritoneal cavity pre-endo, that can start making the cell even more aggressive. The difference uh, between an endo-like cell and endometriosis is the one is the precursor and the other is the disease. So how you can think about this is, a precancerous cell is not cancer. It's not cancer until it's established into cancer. So you basically, um, you know, you have the gun loaded, but it hasn't um, been shot yet, so right. to speak. And that's the same thing with endometriosis. You can have an endo-like cell and you are now predisposed to that cell at any minute turning into endometriosis. Can but I you stop you real quick? Yeah. Do you, can we all have those endo-like cells? Do we all have them? Well, we all have endometrial cells. Um, all of us women. So that's the, that's the question is, um, and potentially why there's endometriosis is, is on the rise. You know, there's one thing, well, maybe we're more of us are being diagnosed, but the amount of inflammation that is appearing in the uterus, in the reproductive tract, in the peritoneal cavity, you know, spurred by all these different inflammatory factors, 
combined with all the chemicals and the immune dysfunction, you can have an endolex cell in your uterus. That's widely regarded. So we always think, oh, endometriosis is only outside of the uterus um, because the lesion itself is growing where it shouldn't. But you can have those endolex cells in the uterus, which might be a problem for people who are dealing with infertility, right? Can you imagine having progesterone resistant cells in your uterus where you're trying to get pregnant? And progesterone is absolutely essential for pregnancy. Um, so yes, I'd say potentially we could all have endo-like cells. There's also, as far as endometriosis itself, there's been um, well-documented tiny microscopic lesions establishing and disappearing in perfectly healthy individuals. So it doesn't seem to progress. This might be um, the fact that, that they don't have endo-like cells. It might be endometrial cells that are kind of establishing your immune system cleans it up just fine. But that's it right there. The difference between an endo like cell and endo lesion, how you get that lesion is your immune system. So it's complete immune dysfunction. So you have this cell that shouldn't be there. First of all, your um, your body should clean it up. You know, this is um, this is what it does every day. It takes out precancerous cells. Like we're actually developing precancerous cells every day, all of us. And that, that was kind of shocking news to me. Like, oh, really? Like, yeah, our cells are always mutating. They're acting totally bizarre. But your immune system cleans them up. So when your immune system stops cleaning them up, that's a problem. The second problem is when your immune system establishes it into your body as a lesion. So it actually takes that endo-like cell and it establishes blood supply, which brings in oxygen and nutrients. So now that lesion, that cell is a living, breathing part of your body, right? It's taking nutrients, it's breathing, it's growing. And every time it grows, what that lesion does is it creates microscopic damage, right? A little bit of growth damages healthy tissue, tissue damage signals to your immune system, we need inflammation. There's something going on here. We shouldn't have tissue damage. So in comes inflammation and the cycle can repeat itself right there. This is part of what becomes um, a cycle that feeds into itself. Um, it's, a, it's called retear. It's repeated tissue injury and repair. It's like a constant inflammatory issue going on. But if you, if you look at it, that's your immune system. That's the one step you want to start. Right? So there's a few steps you want to stop in this story. If you, if you can, the first one is the creation of the endolake cell in the first place. And re research is saying we really need to limit our epigenetic um, triggers that we can really limit those things that we're having exposure to, to help prevent an endolake cell in the first place or prevent just how aggressive it can be. Because the more epigenetic triggers, the more aggressive it can be. Second, you want to stop the immune dysfunction. Like if your immune system is behaving totally radically, just like immune dysfunction, not immune disorder or in cancer, or even something like acne, which is what I use to relate endo to in my book, um, you need to address the immune dysfunction. Why is it dysfunctional? You know, there's a lot of factors that play into that. You know, we have gut infections directly implicated. Um, we have these chemical components. We have chronic stress that never ends, you know, adrenaline and cortisol, all these things are con um, contributing to the immune dysfunction. So you want to stop that too. But just having a lesion does not mean you're going to have stage four endometriosis. So there's a lot that happened between your establishment of an endo lesion and having scar tissue adhesions, you know, sear your ovary to your bowel. There's so much that happened there. And what that is that happened is basically chronic inflammation. So the inflammation never ended. Um, what that does is it creates something called oxidative stress. And I feel like I heard this word so much and I only really understood it a few years ago. And, um, so maybe everyone understands it, but me, I don't know why. I had no, no girl. <laughs> it's, it's hard for all of us to grasp. <laughs> okay. So oxidative stress is so important to know for endometriosis, because basically this is what causes scar tissue and adhesions. Your endo is not causing it. It's inflammation. That's causing scar tissue and adhesions. And you say, what does that mean? Well, inflammation is really, really gnarly. So, um, like I scratched my eye the other day, I have uh, contacts and I scratched my eye and my eye got red and swollen and inflamed. And it really sucks when that happens, right? You like your eye really hurts. Yeah. Um, so the cut didn't do that. That was my immune system responding to the cut. So I say, if you don't have inflammation, if your immune system was shut off, you wouldn't have that. You wouldn't even realize that cut is there. You know, the problem with that is it could introduce bacteria to your eye and then the bacteria would get into your bloodstream and you could um, get infection and die. So your, your inflammation is preventing things like infection, you know, preventing tissue damage from resulting in, you know, something way more sinister for your body. Um, that eye inflammation went away after a few hours. It was like, okay, we sanitized the scene. Now we're going to go away. And, you know, even that inflammation for a few hours can create a little bit of cellular damage because it's really, really nuts. You know, it just like goes gangbusters. It attacks cells, tissues, and bacteria, you know, it attacks everything. Um, and then it goes away. So if it stayed there and my eye was just, you know, had this, all this inflammation, I would probably just go blind, right? This is what it would actually create so much damage without being repaired, that it would damage the eye. 
this is what's happening in our bodies. It's like we have like a thousand internal cuts, you know, caused by all these different factors that I'm talking about, the bacteria, the chemicals, that there's all this poor movement issues, um, low oxygen supply. Your body is constantly triggered, your immune system over and over again, send inflammation, send inflammation, something's wrong. So if you imagine each immune factor has, you know, thousands of bullets, they're shooting everywhere. Well, what's getting damaged in the end is your tissue, your organs, and the tissue damage is what leads to scar tissue adhesions. That's what, that's what oxidative stress is. It's damage caused by inflammation, basically damage caused by your immune system. So when we stop saying um, inflammation is the problem, say your immune system is the problem because it's not stopping the inflammation, um, that's how we can start rewiring that. So you say, okay, well, what if we stop the oxidative stress? That's the next part of it. You know, stop the epigenetic alterations, try to stop the immune dysfunction, definitely do everything you can to stop oxidative stress, which you do through enormous amounts of antioxidants, which literally stop oxidative stress in its tracks and removing as many triggers as you're in control of, because we're not in control of things like our endo lesions, but we are in control of bacteria um, infections from our reproductive tract and our gut translocating to our lesion or the amount of chemicals and stress coursing through our bodies. And that's where um, your goal becomes when you have endo to stop, uh, stop any of that story at any point, try to do your best, you know, and it's not cut and dry for everyone, but um, I've witnessed, you know, enormous health revivals from numerous people. I'm sure you have too, you know, in, in the health world and it can involve a surgery Absolutely. It could be surgery and holistic. Um, and maybe you're really lucky. Like I was very lucky and it's just holistic, but um, every story is just so important to talk about. And um, when you look at the story of endo and fit other people's personal journeys in there, um, it's pretty exciting new research. I mean, that was an incredible description of how it goes from a little cell all the way to full-blown disease. And I am sure everyone listening is going to really appreciate it. And of course, it just makes me think that the pill is not a good option at all. And it, this is so much more than an IUD or a birth control pill or some other medication um, like Lupron, which I know is, is still used. Uh, and so, yeah, it just, it, you know, there's a lot to unpack there for sure. And I, I do want to keep going though, because I feel like there's, you know, so much more good information. And, and that was the next question, right. Uh, that you mentioned just now about the surgery. So does everyone need surgery? <laughs> because that doesn't seem very realistic to me for all of us to not yeah. me necessarily, but for all of us who have endo to be, um, to be needing surgery. I mean, that, that seems so difficult, insurmountable, even insurmountable is a good word. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's, it's also, I'll say very contentious. Like there's, yeah. um, there's a huge movement for a properly done surgery, um, for everyone with endo. And I applaud that movement for, um, lobbying because, well, first of all, I'm sure most people listening know about the difference, but in case you don't, there's two different types of surgeries offered for endo. The one surgery you've only been offered by your local gynecologist is a surgery done by your local gynecologist. It's called burning surgery. You know, they burn the endo superficially. And um, I was told you will probably need one of these surgeries every two years. It becomes a cycle. And I did need one. And then literally two years later, I, I had my another one. And this is when I started getting really mad too. I was like, I'm going to need a surgery every two years. Like this is horrendous. There's a huge difference between that and going to see an endometriosis specialist. They know what to look for. You know, so many people are misdiagnosed because they actually go to get diagnosed with a laparoscopy and the ob had no idea what they were looking at, mm -hmm. um, but they did have endo, right? So you can have endo and they look at it and they even say, well, I went inside. So, um, so there's a big difference there. So the surgery that the, um, the huge endo advocates and I am everyone, you know, everyone who's anyone supports this type of surgery. Absolutely. Um, the, that question I can't answer, and I don't even think um, research can answer where it comes from is, is this is the best way to remove lesions from the body. And many people arrive 10 years in, right? Like they just get their diagnosis and they've had symptoms since they were 15 years old. So you might get yourself, you know, hightail to an endometriosis excision expert. Who's going to look at you and say like, this could be pretty far progressed by now. So I like to say, if you can afford it and you have access to an excision specialist, um, which you can find on icarebetter.com, it's a really great website for, um, for all sorts of endometriosis surgeons around the nation and maybe the world too, uh, but they're, they're really great. They're vetted. Um, 
the thing is there's not enough surgeons in the world to accommodate people with endo. So I did the math the other day. Um, this is someone said, some specialist said there's about 10 surgeons in the United States who are qualified to be excision experts, like real. And maybe that was for the most complex cases. So I'm saying, well, what if we said that's 50, let's just move it up to 50. Maybe there's more, I don't know. But if we say there's 50 and based on the amount of fertile aged women in the United States, if those surgeons were working 20 days a month without break for years, it would take 44 years to have surgery for everyone right now that needs it. Right. So I'll be like 80 years old. <laughs> <laughs> My surgery comes around. It doesn't take into account what else. Hopefully more surgeons come around, you know, once insurance pays for this, there's there's so much hope out there. But for the meantime, a lot of us literally cannot afford it. Um, we don't have access to it. And we need to be helping these people, right? Say, okay, well, you don't have access to surgery. Um, what do you do? And this is where I think there's the second group of, of specialists who say, give it six to 12 months um, to see what happens. Do six to 12 months of integrative care to lower your inflammation. This is not throwing mud at the wall to see what will stick, which I talked about, I did for a whole decade. It's really looking at your patterns and your body and your symptoms, maybe with someone who knows more, you can really find out so much in my book, but just really pinpoint what's going on. Do I have malnutrition? Am I chronically stressed? Even though I'm totally lying to myself and I'm saying I'm not stressed, but my, you know, I'm always a flutter, you know, like really looking into these factors um, and starting to address them one by one, you might find six months in or 12 months in that you feel dramatically better that you get pregnant, you know, that your quality of life comes back around. Um, and I loved what um, Dr. Jessica Drummond, I think she said on your podcast a, a few weeks ago, I listened to that endo and she said, you know, endo is a quality of life issue. So if you, um, if you, if you really want babies, you might definitely be considering a surgical consultation sooner than later because your reproductive system can absolutely be harmed. If you're over babies or um, you, you know, that's not on your agenda and you can get your symptoms to zero or to manageable, then that's your choice. Like it's not going to kill you like cancer. So it literally is a quality of life issue. If you're feeling great and you never had a surgery, who's someone to tell you that you need it? Um, at the same time, never listen to anyone. I say in the holistic world, it says you'll never need a surgery because that's absolutely not true. You might definitely need a surgery. So that's kind of a long-winded answer, I guess, of do you need surgery? It's talk to the experts to see if you do need a surgery. If you can't afford one, like really um, don't, don't listen to the, what I say, the drumbeat of surgery is the only way, because that's where the hopelessness comes in. You know, it shuts the door on treatment and you think there's nothing I can do. And, you know, I could look at a lot of people's diet and lifestyle and say, there's a hundred things you could do today that could dramatically improve your life, even if it is just symptoms. But what if you could stop the endo progression. And this was something that was um, one of the most mind blowing things because I wasn't expecting to find research like this, that endometriosis is not always progressive. So it's called a progressive disease, right? Like um, progressive meaning that it gets worse over time. So it is a progressive disease. It can get worse over time, but it doesn't for everyone. And there is this one review study on women who had repeat surgeries. And so, you know, review looks at different studies overall. And what it showed is that um, 30 percent had endometriosis that progressed into something worse. This is terrible. You don't want to be in that 30 percent. This goes back to check your epigenetics, check your inflammatory stuff, you know, check your immune dysfunction. You don't want to be here. 30 um, percent of people had endo that stabilized. So it wasn't getting worse. It wasn't getting better. This has nothing to do with symptoms, by the way. You can have a small amount of lesions and have terrible symptoms. This was just looking at the disease size and scope. 40% had endometriosis that regressed. It regressed in size. So this isn't to say there's a cure, right? It's just saying that endo isn't always progressive. It's, um, I, I reframe it in the book as it's not a noun, something you get, it's a verb, something that's happening in your body all the time, depending on potentially how your immune system is functioning. Um, you know, how much inflammation you have, uh, maybe you have a huge amount of inflammation, it disappears and like a huge genital infection, for example, there's a whole theory on um, bacterial um, infections and endometriosis. Um, what if that got under control and your endo kind of, you know, shrink the lesions were brought under control again. So this is some amazing research and it goes in line with this other study that looked at women who had their tubes tied purely for birth control. It had nothing to do with endometriosis. They're getting their tubes tied, didn't want any more babies. 
And what the, the surgeons found is that 6% of them had endometriosis that was there, but not causing problems, either inactive. So inactive, it wouldn't be producing inflammatory immune factors, producing estrogen and seemed like they weren't really functioning anymore. Potentially they could also be there and causing some symptoms, but maybe that pain was normalized. That's not what the study was saying. It didn't do an investigative report on these women, but it wasn't causing a bunch of problems. They obviously had babies. This wasn't an issue for them. Um, so that 6% say, you know, if 10% has endo, sorry, it's a lot of numbers. If 10% have endo, if 6% of those women had inactive endo, it goes along with that other study, 70% had stabilized to regress endo. So potentially um, there's a third of us is going to progress and maybe the rest aren't progressing. This isn't to say you won't need surgery or endo. You know, I think there's a lot of advocates think it's dangerous information. And I've heard that before. This is, it's dangerous to have people think that they can um, take control of their endo like this without surgery. And I completely disagree. I think it empowers people to say, I have so much control over what I have control over. You know, if they're, let me test for these gut infections that can translocate to my endo and provoke it more than estrogen. I can test for the reproductive infections that might be causing my infertility, not the endo. You know, I can, I can really deal with the hormonal imbalance. Let me address the progesterone resistance and see what happens. What if you were some of those people that, you know, you're able to stabilize, stabilize the lesions until you got that surgery, for example, you know, which is so different than, oh, diet and lifestyle only helps symptoms. You're saying, no, you want to do everything you can to stop your, your ovary from being adhered to your bowel. Cause that's not okay. And the reason that happened is because of chronic inflammation. Let's stop the chronic inflammation as much as we can to try to prevent that. And this is what research is showing may be possible. There just haven't been studies, obviously, because they become very expensive human studies. And, um, and the only way to look is to go inside someone. So who's going to sign up for double laparoscopies to see before and after, you know, when laparoscopy, you just had your appendix out and you had, you know, blow up your, your belly with gas. It comes with its own risks of complications and scar tissue and inflammation. So who's yeah. going to do that? I'm in physical so like therapy better. right now to get over that. And it's, <laughs> and it's a huge pain. So I can't even imagine. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. I, I mean, first of all, there is so much that you just said that I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> all so good. Um, you said something about the endometriosis. Um, you know, it's just sort of doing its thing. And it reminded me of something I read in a book a long time ago that cancer is just cancering, right? That it's just, yeah. right. So it's just doing what it's supposed to do uh, if it's being fed basically. And so yeah. you're really, I mean, you're really advocating for turning off the, whatever's feeding the beast essentially. Yes. Yes. And, um, I, idea stole from the cancering. I heard a podcast, um, maybe like 15, a long time ago. And it, yeah. that was another mind blowing experience. I was like, no, you just get cancer, right? right? It just appears in your body. It's this alien thing. And no, it turns out cancer is your own body that created a mutated cell. Like, oh, that liver cancer started out as a liver cell. Who knew? <laughs> and then it evolved, turned into cancer. And it's this whole process. So that's, that's why I said it's so similar to cancer in that way. And some research is saying it acts like a benign cancer, basically cancerous like tissue that won't kill you. Benign being won't kill you, but it will like kill your soul. Obviously like endo is so gnarly for some people, not, it's just not as gnarly for other people, but for some people it's, um, it's end of life, right? Like suicide or, um, contemplating suicide, um, the amount of gaslighting it's horrendous. And when you think of, so I just watched my dad go through cancer and, um, he, it was so painful. It was so God awfully painful. And I didn't know cancer could be that painful. Um, the amount of care he got once he, well, he ended up in hospice pretty fast, but before that, there's so much care, like, you know, people saying, yes, cancer can be painful. We really need to address this. We need to stay ahead of the pain. We need to do this preventive stuff. Um, when I want to switch the conversation and say, endo is not a reproductive disease. It is not a fertility. Um, well, it's a, a fertility issue, but it's not a period problem. You know, it's, we're addressing the wrong thing. We're addressing a symptom down river. We need to be treating it like cancer. It is so serious and it is stealing women's lives. It is stealing our fertility. You know, you go through, imagine going through years 15 to 40 and you finally have a hysterectomy because you can't take it anymore. That's 25 years of suffering. It's so not okay. It's unbelievable that this information is so suppressed and damped down and doctors don't know about it. So I would like people to start saying endo is like cancer and it is about time we treated it like such, it's not going to kill you, but it will steal your whole life from you. It's one of the most painful conditions in the world. 
cancer is so painful. We need to treat endo like that too. And it's just so misunderstood just thinking it's, you just, you know, suppress a period and the endo is going to go away. Like get real. Like would ovarian cancer go away by suppressing a period? Like, no. <laughs> so we just need brand new language around this disease. You know, the, the one surgery one time is epic for addressing the lesions, but what about the rest of the body and the incredible amounts of immune dysfunction that are going on? You know, if you don't address that, it can cascade into all these other autoimmune disorders. So to me, that's a disservice as well to the endo community saying we need to help start re-regulating, re-regulating the immune system here so that you don't develop um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis down the way. You know, you don't get celiac if you don't already have it. Cause there's all these sister autoimmune diseases, you know, it's like collect one and you collect them all. You know, just, if you don't address the inflammation, your immune system is going to continue to go crazy and attack yourself. And again, there's no cure for these diseases. You end up managing them your whole life and you can have a basket full. Like I have one and I have endo um, and it's crappy, but you know, I found my own way out and I, I just hope other women can get a resurgence of hope, you know, get angry if you need to, like I did and, you know, do the research and start to to address it in new ways. That's, that's what I hope for. Yeah. I mean, me too. And you mentioned a little while ago about there are 10 different things you could do right now for your endo. Can we talk a little bit about that? Just maybe a little bit about your experience or what you've done or how you have um, written about it in your book for people who are listening. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot there. <laughs> I know. I know. We can we can simplify it. I know, okay. right? I feel like maybe the starting point is how do we start to support our immune system? Where do we right. go from there? <laughs> so the one of the greatest things to understand about immune dysfunction is your immune system is um it is I'm going to say it's working fine in a certain way it's on and moving. So, you know, there's all this, this thought, well, maybe I just need immune support, like to take vitamin C or zinc to reduce the duration of a cold. In the case of endo, your immune system is working freaking hard. You know, you have so much inflammation pumping through your body, but it's not working correctly. So in order to re-regulate immune system, it's like, um, you actually need to teach it to function correctly. And that is by changing all of the inputs you're um, capable of changing, right? So ignore the lesions for a minute and focus on things like um, your stress levels, which I hate saying because no one wants to hear that they're stressed. I didn't, I put in the back of my mind for like, so it was the last thing I wanted to address because I wouldn't even admit I was stressed. So I like to say, create a life of safety, right? Because when you're stressed, you feel like you're in danger a little bit and you can become addicted to it. It even gives us energy when we have chronic fatigue. And I think this was my problem. I became addicted to the the stress and anxiety feeling because it kept me moving in a certain way. So, um, you know, you want to bring down the levels of cortisol and adrenaline. You want to create a life of safety, a lot of times outdoors, a lot of times walking, um, incredible sleep, you know, get to the basis of your sleep, um, eating nutrient dense foods, balancing your blood sugar. And there's probably so much, um, annoyance right now, people listening, like these are so basic, but what I find with my clients when they arrive on my doorstep and they are like doing everything, they say they're doing everything and they are literally spending, you know, thousands of dollars to try to address it. And they are not doing the foundations of health. And these are the things that your immune system says, if you're not sleeping, your immune system one one night of not sleeping well, produces chronic inflammation in the body at a low level. So I had a baby and had two babies. I'm actually, I'm still tired. I don't know who I'm lecturing, but, uh, (laughs) but you know, you can be doing all the things I was eating very healthy, getting outside, doing all this stuff, but I was really had botched sleep every night. And I felt terrible. You know, it was like my kryptonite uh, was not being able to sleep. And it was a great reminder of literally just focusing on sleep. It's free, like master that master your sleep thing. Like move during the day so that you can sleep enough, like avoid the screens. You know, I won't get started on screens. I just talked on a few podcasts about my disdain for screens, but kind of like a hippie at heart like that, (laughs) um, you know, doing dialing in your nutrient dense diet that can take a while. You know, when I say diet, um, and endometriosis, it can be really triggering for people that did what I did. You cut out 50 different food groups. And, you know, I was basically eating like rice and fruit. And I was like, look how clean I'm eating, you know, like not meeting my daily quota for any nutrient at all. And it took me years to reverse my deficiencies. So when, when you start to reverse deficiencies, many of which are associated with endo in many ways, something like, uh, for example, 
Uh, nearly all of us may be so deficient in zinc that researchers are saying it might be a blood test that helps doctors evaluate your risk for endo. Because we're so deficient in zinc, you could say, wow, you're that deficient and you have period pain, pelvic pain, IBS, whatever. Wow, like you might have endometriosis. We should check that out. Like that deficient in zinc. Zinc is critical antioxidant to stop oxidative stress, A. Um, B, to procreate, right? Like if you're dealing with infertility, it was recommended that endo patients should immediately start supplementing with zinc or at least test for zinc before supplementing um, to potentially reverse infertility, right? That, that's one nutrient. Iron, just having endometriosis might render us deficient in iron. And there's a bunch of reasons for this, but, um, but just having it, even if you don't have heavy menstrual periods, and even if you're eating the same amount of iron as someone without endo, you can still be deficient. So um, those are two of many nutrients that I talk about in the book that we're just like failing to get enough nutrients in our body that can a provoke the oxidative stress, which is one thing we want to stop. Like it should be your new mantra. If you have endo stop oxidative stress and how you do that is, you know, increasing the ox antioxidants in your system. Um, iron is essential for delivering antioxidants. So if you're actually deficient in iron, um, you can re enhance your antioxidant defense system by bringing your iron back up to sufficiency. So it's absolutely essential to get your antioxidants where they need to be in your case, right next to your endo lesion, right? Can iron be problematic for endo though? I feel like I've read some research on that too, that it's po possibly feeds endo lesions. That's a great question. And it's, um, it's, I've seen that on social media too. So that's completely um, misinterpreted from the research, but it sounds right because it's iron overload. Right. So iron overload refers to too much iron. I'm going to say in the peritoneal cavity. I know endo can be um, in your brain or your nose or wherever, but I'm just going to stick with like your pelvis area. But too much blood um, is too much iron. And what that does locally is it just means there's too much blood and that can be from your endo lesions bleeding, which they do cyclically. So whenever you have your period, your lesions will bleed and retrograde menstruation, a totally normal part of the menstrual cycle, right? Nearly all of us have retrograde menstruation where your um, menstrual fluid leaks a little bit out of your fallopian tubes into your peritoneal cavity. Well, normal immune systems clean it up just fine, but there's research showing that our immune systems are acting subpar on that. It might be because we have such heavy periods, like people with endo, we can have such heavy periods. There's like huge clots coming out, right? So if that's going into your peritoneal cavity and your lesions are bleeding and that's happening every three weeks without end, your whole area can become swamped with blood, which as the liquid gets sucked out, you're left with iron. That iron becomes incredibly inflammatory right there. So that's called iron overload. Or if you've heard of um, like a gunpowder color burn to endo lesions, that's thanks to iron overload. It's like, um, I mean, it's almost like it's just being electrocuted right there. Right. So that's a problem right there. And one, one thing that is important for, for end of, you know, treatment, this holistic side of things is to get your periods, not so heavy, like really focus on lightening periods so that if you do have retrograde flow, um, that it's not swamping you every month, you know, to, to bring that down. But it's a great question. Cause I do see that. And I see people starting to be a little scared. Cause I think some of that research is like, becoming more predominant on social media, but this absolutely has nothing to do with your um, iron levels. It's not at all. You need your iron levels to be sufficient, you know, never have them be too high, which is why you should always test, especially for something like iron. You should really, you know, you never want these things to be too high, really of any nutrient that's, you know, going the other side of the spectrum, the overload. Right. But for your iron, you can almost assume you're going to be deficient. It's like, how deficient am I? and work with a doctor, it's very easy to get a blood test. Um, you know, any doctor will basically, if you say you have anemia symptoms and really over, you know, overplay the anemia symptoms, I like to say, you know, use your insurance as much as you can. You have your doctor work for you and get a CBC and a ferritin and just see what yours is looking like and supplement to bring it up. Don't be scared that it's gonna affect your endo. It can actually make your endo, you know, better, your symptoms better by bringing more antioxidants to that, to that area that is maybe swamped with, iron and needs antioxidants. Okay. And how do, how do you get rid of that iron, iron overload? If it does happen there, there's, um, no way that I saw in research. They did one where they chelated it. They chelated some, there's like no way you could do this as a human. I think they used rat models or something to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, so what you want to do is you want to prevent more iron from going there. So if you, you can't stop the lesions, like I said, if the lesions are going to bleed, they're going to bleed. But if you have these exceptionally heavy periods, it's like really important to focus on making those periods normal. Right. Um, 
as much as you can, because you have something like adenomyosis or, you know, something else that's going on, fibroids, um, you're, you know, there's some, some things a little bit bigger that won't need to be addressed, but there's a few low hanging fruit. Like you, you know, I'm sure you've had clients like this too, that cut out dairy, um, you know, and they found their periods were so much lighter walking, you know, walking five miles a day. That's my magic number. Just walking, stop with the, you know, incredibly intense exercises and just move your body normally. Um, that can lighten periods and reduce pelvic pain significantly. A Mayan abdominal massage. That's a really great one to, for people with heavy periods. It basically brings more oxygen to your, um, your uterus, more lymphatic flow, and it can lighten periods like that. Um, I just saw Dr. Laura Bright in, in her newsletter. She's talking about antihistamines, taking antihistamines um, during your period to lighten them. So there's a bunch of different factors. One, they work for someone, maybe none, maybe all you need a few of them. So it's, you know, it's always um, just start slow and see how it is, you know, work with a practitioner if you need to. I think a lot of us in the endo world go a little overboard. I'm doing everything in one. So just see, you know, and um, just don't take your heavy periods. Say, oh, I'm always going to have these because I have endo. Say, these might be making my endo worse. So uh, what can I do? And start to look at endo from that lens. What's making my endo worse that I can do from my end of the, the side? I, this was so good. So, so helpful. Is there anything before we close out this episode that you would feel that you, that my listeners should know about endometriosis or anyone who is listening, who does have endo? Um, oh gosh, so much. Some final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if it's a final thought, I just, I want to say, um, to not lose hope. And um, to be kind to everyone's journey, I think, um, you know, social media, we get a lot of information about endo on social media, a lot of us turn there. And I think online, there's so much anger about this disease right now, and people calling out other people's very personal stories, um, which is very unkind, like someone posted a woman who had endo giving her baby, um, what's it called gender reveal. And this other woman had a video of it and was saying, don't do this. This is triggering the people who have endo and can't have babies. And it was just like this angry calling out. And I see this all the time. Like your story doesn't matter. Your story doesn't matter. You're misrepresenting endo. And I just don't feel like it has to go like that. There's, there's so much, um, none of us know about endo and there's so much, even, um, experts don't know about endo. There's so much, I don't know about endo, but we have all these amazing patient stories that, um, you know, they need to be shared, you know, everywhere from the person who was gaslighted all the way through their hysterectomy and missed their ability to have babies all the way to the person that really did some basic diet and lifestyle and they got pregnant and they never had endo symptoms again. So I think we need to be very open-minded. Um, and for you listening to this, never compare your story to someone else. And I think that's so important because, um, you know, Molly might have done pelvic floor physical therapy and her life changed and you did it and it didn't work at all. And you can feel like a failure, like, well, if it worked for her and she has endo, it doesn't work for me, but that might not be your issue. You might be completely deficient in zinc and iron and vitamin C <laughs> and you need a surgery or, you know, you need, um, you know, some strategies to deal with having chronic anxiety, whatever it is, there's, everyone is on their own path. And Remembering that endo is multifactorial, meaning there's many factors that go into creating and progressing endo and they don't line up with every sufferer shouldn't make us feel crazy. It should make us feel a little more empowered and say, yeah, I'm going to stop comparing myself with that girl over there. That's not getting anywhere with her healing or that girl over there. That's on her high horse because hers is completely gone. Like I'm really just going to focus on me um, and following my symptoms and um, one foot in front of the other, right? Like if you, I guess it's like a lot of advice now, <laughs> but if you start yes. somewhere, anywhere, you know, there's this, you could do 20 things. What if you just did one thing really, really well, you know, what if for the next month, what if for December and January and February, you just worked on getting a nutrient dense diet and balancing your blood sugar. You tried not to snack, um, you know, just four to five hours between meals. Like that was your goal. See how you feel in February. And once you master something like whole foods cooking, which does take a while, it can be a headache at first. You need a lot of forgiveness. Um, self-forgiveness for all your fails. And um, then you can move on to the next thing. Say, well, yeah, now I'm going to really work on my barefoot walking in the forest and try to get up to five miles a day. So what I'm going to do for the next three months. And then you work up, you do these big wins and you see how you feel in a year, you know, and you can look back and say, I've had all these successes, but I still feel crummy. So I'm going to look to surgery or maybe like, I feel great now. You know, there's, there's no one thing that works for everyone, but that's my that's what I'll leave everyone with all of that. It was, it was all amazing. Very good <laughs> stuff. 
Thank you so much, Katie. I feel like we could keep going. I feel like we need a part two for sure um, to talk about the politics of endo. <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Um, yes, but tell everyone where they can find your book, the name. I know you have two books um, and yeah. where they can find you. Yeah, so I'm at healendo.com. Um, on Instagram, I'm heal.endo, but I'm not on there a lot. Um, but my book that just came out is Heal Endo, an anti-inflammatory approach to healing from endometriosis. I talk all about reframing endometriosis, like what we're talking about. We need to absolutely reframe it, that whole story, exactly how the immune dysfunction works, how the endo like cells created. And then the rest of it is really the holistic healing, which is, you know, chapters and chapters of what the research says about this stuff. So it's not just um woo woo crystal healing healing. I really dug into the research. So you can find that um, on Amazon, but it's linked through my website as well. So if you just get to healendo.com, you'll find all of that. Amazing. Thank you again so, so much. And for everyone who's listening, I will see you on the next episode. Thank you for being here as always. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wrap. Be sure to click that subscribe button to join me for more Girl Talk Gone Menstrual in upcoming episodes. But in the meantime, check out my latest period party episode. And if you're looking for a deeper dive into your hormones, go ahead and take my period quiz at nicolejardim.com quiz.